Um, now, the nature of this course is built around the idea of conversations, and you students are having so many conversations um, after this evening and throughout the week. And one of the things that um, I want to acknowledge that you've been doing is thinking in advance about this question of justice. And I want to just share with you a few of the, um, the thoughts about justice that our students shared. Justice is standing up for people who need help, especially for people who aren't as privileged as others. Justice is protecting people's right to live and exist freely as long as they aren't harming anyone else. Justice is the restoration of love, is avoiding cruelty, is accountability, is a moral obligation, requires tolerance. Justice is getting what you deserve. Justice is acknowledging the rights that all humans share. And then right after that, justice is caring for not only humans, but all living things. Justice is a primal human urge to create harmony in an ever-conflicted world. Thank you, students, for leading the way into tonight's question. But this said, it will not be our goal this evening to answer the question, what is justice? It's too big. It's simply too big. But one way we might frame the question tonight might be, how can we live well or better together? In a few moments, you'll hear from an evidence scholar, a social and environmental justice scholar, and an artist, Black Lives Matter activist, to understand the varying ways in which ideas about justice are intrinsic to their work. In this never before on stage together gathering, we will have the opportunity to hear how each of these extraordinary thinkers and doers and makers put questions of justice at the heart of their passionate labor. Thus far, together, we have pondered the university and we have contemplated knowledge. Tonight, let us use the setting of the university to contemplate justice and how it sits as a wellspring for new knowledge and action in multiple fields. And so I would like now to just, the bios of our guests are in your programs, but if you haven't had a chance to read them, if you will allow me to read to you. Fumilola Fagbamila is a playwright, scholar, activist, performance artist, and original member of the Black Lives Matter movement. She serves as a professor of Pan-African Studies at California State University, Los Angeles, and her current project entitled The Intersection, Woke Black Folk, is a stage play on the complexities of black political identity. And I saw that play, and I just want to say, I'm really glad Fumilo is here. This production was met with critical acclaim by thinkers and artists such as Angela Davis and Erica Badu, and recently completed a European tour. In both 2015 and 2018, Fumi Lola was honored by the United States Congress for her act activist scholarship. Jennifer Manukin became dean of the UCLA Law School in August 2015, as time flies. As dean, she has spearheaded initiatives, including the first alumni leadership conference, conference, new programs in human rights, criminal justice and immigration, and the expansion of clinical opportunities. A leading evidence scholar, Dean Manukin is founder and faculty co-director of PULSE at UCLA Law. PULSE stands for the Program on Understanding Law, Science, and Evidence. She has co-authored two major evidence treatises, has published extensively on issues relating to forensic science, and has advocated for developing a research culture in these areas. Dean Manukin is a member of National Academy of Sciences Committee on Science, Technology, and Law, and has co-chaired a group of senior advisors for our President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology, in addition to other leadership initiatives in her field. 
There is going to be a quiz about this later, so <laughs> listen up. Um, Stephanie Pinsettel is professor in residence at the UCLA Institute of the Environment and Sustainability and founding director of the California Center for Sustainable Communities at UCLA. She conducts research on environmental policies and governance with a focus on social and environmental justice and the need to develop equitable strategies to reduce human impacts on the planet. Dr. Pinsettel has written extensively about land use in California, environmental justice, habitat conservation efforts, urban metabolism, water and energy policy. Her book, Transforming California, the Political History of Land Use in the State, is the definitive work on land use and politics and policies of California. Pinsettel received the prestigious Burel, Burel? Bur Burel? Award from the American Association of Geographers and has been awarded the 2020 Fulbright Distinguished Chair in the Geography Department at the University of Manchester. Please join me in welcoming our guests. So actually, I think we're going to make a pretty swift move um, uh, because Jennifer has, oh yeah, me and Val. <laughs> Jennifer has some, um, some things that we're going to look at, so we might just slide down to the audience with you all. Um, but now you see these very people who I've introduced. Mm -hmm. So welcome. Thank you for participating in 10 Questions. And let's let Jennifer have the space, and uh, we can watch what she watches. Terrific. Well, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, Vic. And I'm just thrilled to get to share this stage with these uh, two fabulous um, other uh, practitioners of thinking about doing justice. So it's just it's a pleasure and an honor to be here tonight. Um, we are trying to do something impossible to talk about justice in just a few minutes. This is such a large topic and one that has uh, that, that from everybody from philosophers to activists have grappled with over the millennia. And so we can't really do that. And so I think what I at least am going to do instead is to try to drill down a little bit and look at something more specific about one frame for thinking about justice and about how, that, how that's changed a little bit in my lifetime. Some of you are so young that, that, that you weren't alive when this movement started, but it's something I've seen and to a certain degree participated in as we think about justice in the criminal justice system in particular. And I'm gonna look specifically at how ideas about wrongful convictions and what they are and why they happen have also opened the door for a broader conversation about the criminal justice system that goes well beyond the problem of factual innocence and justice to bigger, broader, systemic questions about what justice looks like. And I'm going to try to do that in about 12 to 14 minutes. <laughs> so we'll see. Um, so justice in criminal law. There's an old adage attributed to Sir William Blackstone back in 1765 that it's better that 10 guilty people go free than that one innocent suffer. It captures an I one idea about justice, right? Um, there are others, but one idea is that we must protect the innocent from facing consequences in the criminal justice system, and that we should be willing to let some of those who are guilty not face justice rather than make an error like this. And this is a well-known adage. Probably some of you have heard it before, but it goes way back, and he gets the alleged credit for talking about it, um, at least writing it down in a way that, that stuck. And for a long time, this, this was, there were many in our system who believed that our system here in this country lived by this rule, that we had a criminal justice system that erred on the side of protecting innocence. This was a widespread belief in 1923, a very well-known judge said in an opinion, he called, the, he called actual innocence a ghost that was an unreal dream, that we had a system that was so focused on this, on this anxiety 
that somebody might be wrongfully convicted, that we went overboard, that we almost had maybe too much protection in order to protect the innocent. So there were lots of people, and this is now almost hard for us to kind of understand or believe because we've, we've learned so much about wrongful conviction in the time since then. But it's important to understand that there really were many people, many progressive people, who truly believed that for serious crimes, very few actually innocent people ever got convicted. That was a widespread belief, and it turns out to be quite wrong. I think probably most of you in this room understand that it's quite wrong, but it's stage setting that's actually, I think, important for understanding how we think about justice. So the old mythic view that was quite widespread is that wrongful convictions were extremely rare, that we had a whole set of ways to prevent them, and that ranged from the presumption of innocence, the formal presumption that anybody being brought before a criminal tribunal is assumed to be innocent until proven guilty, that we had right to counsel, at least for serious crimes, that we had lawyers provided. Um, if somebody can't afford a lawyer, the state will provide them for, for felonies and serious crimes. That we had our high standard of proof beyond a reasonable doubt. That if you were left with any reasonable doubt, you as a juror were not supposed to convict. That we required a unanimous jury of your peers in order to convict that there were an array of constitutional protections. And the idea that was widespread, not universal, I don't want to overstate it, but widespread is that these were powerful protections, at least for serious crimes, that meant that the problem of actual innocence was not a terribly serious one in the criminal justice system. Yes, any human system can make mistakes, but the idea was that this wasn't terribly commonplace. Now, to be sure, some defense attorneys and public defenders thought otherwise, even when this mythic view was widespread. But many judges believed that they had never overseen a trial where somebody factually innocent had been convicted of a serious crime, right? Well, then, much changed. And some of that change is actually located in the rise of DNA. That what happened with DNA testing is it began to provide a form of evidence that was very hard to dispute and began to be taken very seriously as proof. And there began to be DNA exonerations that showed that, in fact, there were people who had been behind, behind bars for very lengthy periods of time who DNA evidence now proved dispositively hadn't done the thing that they were accused of. This began to emerge primarily in rape and murder cases, because that's where we would have biological evidence that could be tested. And there was a lot of engagement in the criminal justice system about whether, whether convicted you know, defendants should have the right to DNA testing, and, and there were fights about that, and there were fights about what happens if somebody is shown not to have committed the crime, or at least if there's now a strong argument that they didn't. But overall, it is a kind of remarkable story about how this new technology um, began to create new narratives about justice and the criminal justice system that showed up the mythic quality of this conception, right? That showed that if you believed that, that it was extraordinarily rare for somebody to be wrongfully convicted, you had to contend with this very hard to dispute scientific evidence showing that actually the, bl the, 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 the blood found on the victim's shirt did not belong to the defendant, or that the, the semen sample did not come from the defendant, and that in fact an injustice had occurred. Um, this is just a chart of exonerations. You can see that the first DNA exonerations happened in 1989. I think there's just one that year. Overall, there have been a several hundred DNA exonerations over these decades, and there's also been an increase in non-DNA exonerations. This chart comes from a really interesting national registry of exonerations that our sister school, UC Irvine, co-operates together with the University of Michigan, where they document every known exoneration and a little bit of what happened. And there's still lots of questions about wrongful convictions and how often they occur. There are still debates about whether the ones we know about are just the tip of the iceberg or whether we are 
are coming close to seeing a, a, a decent percentage of them. There's still lots of issues that are not fully understood about what causes them. Um, but I would say that it is now impossible to still hold on to that mythic earlier view that says that they're not part of our criminal justice system. You have to accept whether you consider these to be large numbers or modest numbers in the grand scheme of our criminal justice system, that factually innocent people are regularly being convicted of quite serious crimes, and that all of those protections that we allegedly have within our system are not, in fact, protecting the factually innocent. I think that's now become something that's extremely hard to dispute. And that changes how we think about criminal justice and justice more generally. Now we've learned some aspects of, it's hard to say if these are, we can't, you can't say that this fully causes wrongful convictions, but we've learned by auditing and examining wrongful convictions, what, what made these happen in these individual cases? What are some of the underlying symptoms that we can see? And this shows you some of the repeated problems that we see. What you can see is that Eyewitness, mistaken eyewitness identification is a frequent problem, right? That witnesses come and say, this is the person who did this to me, and they turn out to be wrong. They often believe it, right? This is not, they're, they're not necessarily like trying to do injustice, but they are making mistakes. It turns out that humans are not terribly good at identifying strangers, especially in stressful circumstances. It gets even harder when it's cross-race identification, it turns out. It also gets harder if there's a weapon involved, that the focus on the weapon may make it even harder to remember much about the face. But eyewitness identifications are one significant issue in these wrongful conviction cases. Perjury or false accusations, another cause. False confessions turn out to be present too. There are numerous wrongfully convicted people who confessed to a crime they didn't commit. This puzzles people sometimes. They ask, why would someone do that? But it turns out that especially if there have been very long interrogations or people who might have some degree of impairment or, or, or young people or people who just feel overpowered by the system and think there's no hope, that it is absolutely possible for people to be in situations that lead them to confess to crimes they, don't commit, they didn't commit. One kind of tragic reason this sometimes happens is that in interrogation processes in this country, the interrogators do not have to be honest about the evidence they have. So an interrogator can say, oh, we've got DNA evidence, we're going to prove it's you, you might as well confess now because we've got the goods. They can do that even if they don't have DNA evidence. And if you've been sitting there and you've been under interrogation for many hours and you think, oh, I can get out of this room if I just say I did it, and later they'll test that evidence and they'll see I didn't. Well, in theory, maybe, but, but if they don't have that evidence, you've just confessed and you have a much, much more serious problem. That's just one example, but the point is to just say that, wrong, that, that, that false confessions really do occur, and that comes as a psychological surprise to some. But again, the wrongful conviction audits have shown up that confessions, which used to be thought the queen of proofs, the thing that could not be argued with, turn out to have problems too. Forensic evidence also has significant issues. Many kinds of forensic evidence that are regularly used are in fact far less scientifically validated than, than people think. There's much less authority and reliability in testing behind them. Sometimes forensic examiners also just straight up overclaim or go beyond that which they're supposed to say by the tenets of their field. In other cases, they do what they're supposed to do, but it turns out that they don't really know error rates or how often they make mistakes or make claims that are just kind of nuts, like that, that they can tell one bullet from another to the exclusion of all bullets in the universe and all other guns, even though there's no validation studies to justify those kinds of extreme claims. So this turns out to be another significant issue. It's one I've spent some of my own scholarly time about, but we're going to leave it for now and move on. And then 
Problems with, with uh, prosecutorial misconduct also occur, where prosecutors haven't followed some of those constitutional protections. They haven't given over Brady material that they were supposed to. Too much reliance on jailhouse snitches who, who uh, might have a strong incentive to say that they heard a confession or otherwise had evidence that wasn't, that, that, that wasn't what actually occurred. And so these two become stories, new stories, or at least expanded stories in our criminal justice system, where previously some of these didn't get so much attention. But now they begin to be part of the narrative of how we have to think about justice and injustice and what we're doing right and what we're doing wrong. Now, what I want to suggest in the last couple of minutes that I have with you is that this set of stories about the factually innocent be have begun to create new stories that go beyond the factually innocent. When somebody is behind bars for a crime that they literally did not commit, that's kind of the easy textbook case of injustice, right? That's, that's the ghost that all of us are anxious about. But that space, which is kind of an indisputable space about justice or injustice, has begun through the new stories that it's created in the criminal justice system to provide some currency that's linked with broader movements. I don't want to suggest that this is only about wrongful convictions, but to permit a set of new stories about the criminal justice space more generally and what counts as justice and what counts as, in, as, as injustice. So wrongful convictions and these stories about factual innocence and the art that's been produced about them too, whether documentaries or feature films or other kinds of, of artistic engagement around these questions has reduced trust in some of this, these questions about whether our systemic protections work and whether we can believe in our criminal justice system more generally that have opened some very um, challenging but also exciting spaces of reform. So this has played some role in opening the door to broader conversations about topics like mass incarceration. How should we be thinking about mass incarceration when we lose trust in whether our system's even making the right distinctions between the factually guilty and those who aren't? Excessive policing. Even if somebody did the thing that they're being accused of, was there so much policing in their community that their chances of being, of being, um, of being caught for it or brought under the, the system were so much different than would have been in a different community? Or are we looking for some kinds of crimes far more than we're looking for some other kinds? How do we think about retribution versus restorative practices in a system that we have to acknowledge is so deeply far from perfect? How do we think about these issues in connection with race and the criminal justice system? How do we think about these issues when we see from the wrongful conviction space the uh, the, the tremendous disparity in resources from most criminal, indigent criminal defendants compared to what the state can bring to bear. And so this wrongful conviction space, which began in a narrow way, has opened up some spaces for these important, broader stories about our criminal justice system and bigger questions about how do we do justice what counts as injustice? And how do we create a system that we believe can be fairer to all? This leaves us not so much with answers as with questions and with an obligation. An obligation to ask and an obligation to, to hold to account. To act what does justice look like and what should justice look like. And it's created a space where we're beginning to see some real traction for criminal justice reforms, ranging from transformation of the bail system, for example, to uh, new engagement around the death penalty and the appropriateness of those kinds of punishments, to the creation of the progressive prosecution movement, where there's starting to be prosecutors who are interested in questions like the integrity of convictions and are there ways to go about this that would reduce mass incarceration. And so wrongful convictions have begun to change that narrative. It's just one node in a much broader set of conversations. But I thought I would use this time to try to describe briefly 
how we can use ways in to think about justice in new ways and how that's happening right here, right now, in ways that many of my students at the law school and many faculty members want to be part of, and in ways that I hope some of you will think about as well. Thank you very Thank much. You. just going to make a shift directly to Professor Pinsetto and thank you so much Jennifer uh, I don't know. <laughs> so thank you very much for I'm on right uh, for inviting me and for an extraordinary succinct but absolutely inspirational talk so Justice, as you can see, has lots and lots of manifestations in society. And I have been interested in the question of the environment, in the question of how we treat each other and how we treat the environment, and the questions of equity that are embedded in those, in those issues in contemporary US society. I'm actually not a biophysical scientist or a person who works in empirical analysis. Um, but I've been very, very fortunate to have a few ideas that were timely to get funding and to hire an extraordinary team of researchers who, with whom we ask, I think, really important questions about the ways in which cities work. So um, most of us now live in cities for reasons we can talk about as well. You know, is there a new enclosure movement forcing more people into cities and living miserable lifestyles? That's one question. Um, but what I want to fo focus on today is really the question of how cities sustain themselves. Who uses how much energy, water, resources, where? What does that tell us about equitable distribution? What does it also tell us about how much we're extracting from the planet? And if, are those extractive activities sustainable over the long run, given what we know about climate change, but also what we know about the depleting amount of natural resources on the planet? There are places in northern uh, LA County where there's no more sand to make concrete, right? So we're having to import sand from much farther away. Things like that are really beginning to emerge, but they're kind of subtle and hidden. And yet, it's all about how we use the resources in uh, the places we live. So one of the things that we uh, have been very, very focused on is looking at the distribution of how energy and water, too, is used across geographical space by a bunch of characteristics, by um, uh, income, by ethnicity, by built square feet, by age of house, and so on. Because once you have an empirical understanding of that, you begin to be able to ask all kinds of really interesting questions that relate to um, energy justice, who has the best kind of service, who's able to put solar on their roofs, who's constrained to put solar on their roofs because of structural factors of inequality. Of environmental justice, are the constraints to be able to make the energy transition also associated with higher levels of air and water pollution or toxic substances? Of social justice, can they participate in proceedings and understand what's going on and voice their desires? And then finally, also the questions of climate justice, because how much energy we use, how much materials we use, affect um, the way the planet is, is working today. So in order to do this, we um, built this uh, tool called the Energy Atlas. Um, it's available online. It's, uh, you can look it up uh, at any time, uh, maybe after this. Uh, <laughs> And what we have been able to do, which is a, a something that n hasn't been done anywhere to my knowledge, is uh, obtain address level consumption data for all of the Edison territory uh, consumers, the gas company consumers of gas, and LADWP. And that's a huge territory. And what we're able to then do is get parcel level data about what kinds of buildings they are their size, their use, their age, um, and then their geographical location relative to heat, all kinds of things. And what the Energy Atlas then does is uh, provide the ability to search. So say you live in El Segundo, and you're interested in what's going on in uh, Carson, right? So you can look at, 
the average amount of energy that's used, electricity, natural gas, combined BTU, greenhouse gas emissions. You can look at the parcel size. You can look at income. And you begin to see a whole world of energy consumption that is extraordinarily unequal across landscapes. We were able to, scouring the data, show that residents in Malibu use 11 times more energy than residents in South LA. Um, but the houses per square foot in Malibu are a lot more efficient. They're just gigantic. And the houses in, East, in South LA are tiny and leaky. So who's the problem? Who uses the least amount of energy? Well, if you're low income and you live in a small house, you use less energy. And we're chasing increased consumption with efficiency, and it doesn't work. So you can scroll and you see all this data. And what we can learn is um, all of these things, <laughs> right? Duh, did I really need to know, do this to find this out? But it is important to have the empirical data when you are trying to convince policymakers, or as, as Jennifer was saying, it's a kind of irrefutable kind of evidence, right? And it allows also those communities to be empowered to engage with the different kinds of policymakers and to really have a grasp of what's going on and then advocate for the ener a just energy transition, for example. And we can't, so. Um, so the chimera that I think, this is a chimera, I had to look it up, uh, chimera, as they say uh, through Google, um, is like a fictional goal. And the fictional goal that we have been living with is that we are going to be able to reduce our impacts through efficiency. Clearly, we have failed. Clearly, it is not possible. And so justice comes up in terms of what's enough? Who gets what? And how do we then think about a society we want to live in where there is a better distribution of what everybody needs? So clearly, this is not sustainable. And this is the direction we've been going in. So you add new kinds of technologies. You need new kinds of elements. Those elements are found in places like the Congo, like Mongolia, places where there's an enormous environmental and social impact, and there's no accountability about those impacts. So on, the, on that side, um, that's a lake in Mongolia that's been totally heavily polluted by lithium, the key ingredient for batteries, right? Lithium ion batteries, the best batteries you can buy. Not free. On the right is an example of an open pit copper mine that is so prevalent um, across various parts of the world and that has enormous consequences for the local people. The other thing that's so important about realizing this and looking at that open pit mine is what's happened is we've scraped off the best. The best copper has already been mined. And that is beginning to happen for a number of these really important elements. And what does that imply? It means that the next layer, the next level of quality is going to require a lot more energy resource to extract. What kinds of resources are we using in those big machines? We don't have lithium ion earth movers, battery earth movers, right? And you've seen those pictures of those enormous machines, right, with tires that are like almost the size of this room. So energy is embedded in all of these transitions toward something that will use less energy? Can we continue to think in that way? Or do we have to radically reconsider the direction that we're going in, the kinds of cities we want to live in, and the activities that we engage in together? So I've, this is a very short talk, um, but I think that for a livable future, Justice must be a guiding principle. But this kind of justice has to be, have a little bit more, um, less, less kind of legal definition, if you will. It has to be about principles of ethical living, which involve compassion. We have to be able to engage in, in a compassionate way with others. It's really hard to do. It's easy to do in the abstract. I can think of Donald Trump, to be completely blunt here, and say, 
that guy, he had a terrible childhood. He's just living out his anger all the time. How can you live with that much anger? How come he doesn't just explode? So I have compassion for him. I think, wow, you poor guy. At the same time, he's <laughs> a pretty messed up guy. Doing terrible stuff, so it's really hard. Um, wisdom. Wisdom is something we never talk about. What is wisdom? How do, we, how do we wisely see what's going on with a vision to the future? How do we think more, more in a more integrated and long-term way? That's just one way of thinking of wisdom. Ethics. Ethics and truth are very akin, right? They have, very, they have a very close relationship. They're not quite the same, but there's a very close relationship there. As um, Fumi was talking about earlier before everybody came, there's this question of love. Love is a really, really big one. And the st one student talked about um, justice as love. Well, Obama talked about love. No one else talks about love. Love is like wussy or something, right? Mm -hmm. But love is so powerful, right? It's, the most, it's an enormously powerful emotion that we need to grow and cultivate. Courage, that's a really, really big one, too. Because courage is something that is, needs to be cultivated and supported. Morality, also close to questions of ethics and justice, but slightly different, maybe. Grace. How about grace? That's hard, too, to be gracious, to remain polite, to try to always acknowledge that the other person is a person in that discussion, whether you're talking to the DWP person that you're so pissed off about because you can't get through, you spend an hour on the phone and you want to take it out on that person. But right, it's just about how you, uh, your attitude um, in the way you engage. Goodness, we all know what these words actually kind of mean, right? But we don't practice them enough. And so we need to have these developed in a commitment to relieve, oops, suffering um, and hatred. So justice is also about a moral behavior. And I want to leave you with one quote that I really like, but I need my glasses and my book. <clears throat> So um, some philosophers talk about practical virtue, the virtue of virtues, the master virtue. It's about finding the golden middle way. But what they also talk about is that takes practice and a teacher. Who is out there teaching about um, justice and the middle way? How do we learn? Well, how are we un inculcated with those values and those ways of behaving? And um, Dewey, who is a, a prag pragmatist philosopher, talked about um, democracy being an especially demanding system of government because it requires practical wisdom of all its citizens. Hannah Arendt talks about politics as the art by which we navigate our plurality, plurality, plurality of difference, balancing our own aims with those of other members of the political community. It takes practical wisdom, but that is entirely teachable. So one of the things that I think we need to encourage is, is how we cultivate these virtues in order that we live a better life into the future. And I keep fantasizing <laughs> that if we spent the amount of money that we spend um, with, the, with the budget for the Pentagon on teaching these virtues, things would probably be a little different out there. But we, unfortunately, don't invest in any of it. So um, that's what I have to say. I want to thank everybody for being here and for the opportunity to express these thoughts. And I think it's a good sign that we're talking about these things. Wow. Um, well, I think we're going to just make a transition right over to you, Fumilola. And do you like the stage set here for whatever you're about I'm gonna to do? I'm switch it up a little bit. OK. Yeah. 
I'm not in this, but I'm just going to grab some water. Okay. Hydrate. Check, check. Check, check. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Wake up. Hello. <laughs> Thank you, Jennifer and Stephanie, for just the brilliant and necessary words that you've offered. I mean, I want to add to what you've said here and what you've offered us in terms of thinking through justice, if I can get my props to stay where they need to be. Here we go. Um, so Victoria mentioned a bit of the work that I do, and um, I'm deeply involved with conversations around racial justice, around um, restorative justice. And I talk a lot about and engage in my creative work some of the challenges to doing the necessary work that would be needed to discuss, critique, transform the institutions that need to be challenged in the society if we're talking about some of the fundamental institutions that, in essence, facilitate some of the anti-blackness that we see present in our societies. And so in order to do that, I wrote a story that engages those conversations. So I'm going to introduce you to four people. These people are not me. Um, but I know them, and maybe they will be familiar to you too as well. So in the tradition of black theater, you can clap, you can, you can boo, you can sneeze, you can literally do anything. You can get up and, and shout if you desire. You can do whatever it is. Um, but in the tradition of black theater, you are allowed to react according to how you feel, um, if you so feel moved to. So I'm going to start with a question and ask. Check, check. Who's woke? Oh, you? You woke? Let's <laughs> just check. Me? Oh, I've been woke. Stays woke. <laughs> so you've been woke and then you, I understand. Okay. So kind of woke. Okay, so you're affirming, understood, confidence. Me? I've been woke. Stays woke. Let me rewind. Some of y'all not hearing what I'm talking about. Woke. W-O-K-E. Adjective. Definition. Aware. Knowledgeable about what's happening in your communities and in the world with the ability and willingness to assess and critique how social, political, and economic systems of oppression operate at macro and micro levels. Yes, yes, yes. So I was working one day and I met a black man and he seemed rather woke onk around his neck, a scent of nag champa smoke. <laughs> he said, queen sister, mother of the earth, black girl, let me treat you like goddess. Let me come into your world. Said he's equipped with the knowledge and he's got all the facts about the stolen history and all the good that came from blacks. He's talking math and science and physical equations that they claim to have created after pillaging our nations. To win, then first we have to look within. And really, if we're gonna fight, then first we have to reunite. And really, if it's gonna work, then we gotta drop the bullshit. You know, all of this European influence on us, I'm not cool with. The gays and the queers, homosexual agenda ploy to effeminize the black male. <laughs> but no, I never surrender. Woman, black child, very simple. See, it's this feminism always getting in the middle. 
said he can't stand these academics, obnoxious black feminists. Well read, very angry, and probably in need of a therapist. Maybe some green juice as well. It'll clean out the system. You know, they eat in swine and dairy and other foreign organisms. Going to white man's school to acquire a degree so you can get you some prestige and earn a living salary, but we don't need no recognition from the white man, you see. This man believes entirely in African divinity. I say, okay, black man, but really, what you trying to say? Said that he's woke and he's willing and wants freedom for black people today. I say, okay, and I keep walking. And so I keep walking, but then I come across a black woman reading a book. She says to me, gender binaries are an illusion and patriarchy is a crook. Says she looks forward to the day when all black lives will matter. I can't even see through my damn glasses. <laughs> says she looks forward to the day when all black lives will matter, including queer and trans and those deemed unworthy of chatter, no conversation about the plight of those who remain invisible, like black women and girls and those for whom a gendered category is simply inapplicable. She's fed up. Tired of explaining all the time how her sexuality is not aligned with your feminine divine, she tells me, look, how are black people to prevail when we are ideologically trapped in this damn hotep hell, reproducing the very systems that once stripped us of humanity? Fake deeps, the epitome of anti-intellectuality. She sighs from exhaustion then returns to her book, then says her dissertation looks at how black patriarchy cooks up the intra-racial conflict that impedes liberation. And if we could just deal with complexity, that'd be means for celebration. She takes a sip from her mug, then proceeds to explain. You know that it's, it's very important that we as black people in academia speak and write in ways that are accessible to black people outside of these spaces. You know, we must fully reject any form of academic elitist exclusivity. And further, we must acknowledge that the differentiation of radical alterities is conducive to the conceptual logic of a truly advantageous and inclusive black liberatory praxis. But really, black woman, what you trying to say? Said that she's woke and she's willing and wants freedom for black people today.
I say, okay, and I keep walking. So I keep walking, but then I come across a man who seeks to implement a plan with a loudspeaker in his hand. He says, it is our duty to fight like it is our duty to win, like we must protect one another and love one another. Okay, black man, what do we protest? He says, they get away with it. No consequence at all, but we won't take it lying down. Nah, let's keep going, y'all. They said, black lives matter. Then they said again, black lives matter. Then the cops came. Black lives matter. You're going to have to move. Black lives matter matter. Now I'm warning you. Black lives matter. Sir, you're under arrest. Black lives matter. Black lives matter. Black lives matter. It's now a few hours later. He was in and out fast. Intimidation tactics. Says he's used to being harassed. You know, I catch a lot of flack for all the work that I do. Black people call me extreme. I'm out here Academics say we don't have a thought through plan sitting in that ivory tower with a book in your hand. Don't get me started on these internet activists today. Don't come to not one of the meetings, but got everything to say on Facebook. <laughs> Typing from the comfort of your seat. Black people out here dying, you gonna sit at home and tweet running your mouth about everything we are not doing right. The ones that are on the ground with our bodies in plain sight. Ain't it a shame? Y'all good for talking. Talk all night and day. But y'all scared of revolution. What the last poet say? Mm-hmm. I say, okay, black man, but really, what you trying to say? Said that he's woke and he's willing and wants freedom for black people today. I said, okay. And I kept walking.
So I keep walking. Then I come across black woman on her phone. She says, she says, she wishes these black radicals would leave the shit alone. <laughs> They're making things worse. I mean, really, how much can we complain? We had a black man in the White House. Look how much we have gained. And I mean, yes, racism is real. I get that part. But do you think you're going to change bark? Just bark about every single thing that doesn't go your way with your bullhorn and your picket sign. What really will you change? And yes, I understand that you demand basic civility. But when are we going to talk about black accountability? We have to address our part in the matter, and if we don't, then we're setting ourselves up for a disaster. Pull your pants up. Respect yourself. And maybe then you'll get respect. We have to do better at keeping each other in check. I mean, we kill each other, then focus our attention on police. The approach is counterproductive, and quite frankly, it's obsolete, and we must shift our energy. How negative can we be? If all we think about is bad things, then we manifest it, you see. I was reading like this book like the other day, and it literally said exactly what I always say. You attract what you think about the most, you know? And if we think more progressively, then it will be so. But when I express how I feel, black people call me a coon. But I just want what's best for us, and I want it soon. I say, Okay, black woman, but really what you trying to say? Said that she's woke and she's willing and wants freedom for black people today. I say okay, and I keep walking. So I took you on a trip with me. We met four black folks with four different ways of thinking, but they all call themselves woke. Who's really woke? Character one, with a juice the color green, and a politic that demeans those he doesn't see as kings and, and queens. Or character two, the academic, who stands up for the ones most invisible, but speaks in a language we can't all understand an excess of syllables. Or character three, the activist, always on the front line, but criticizes those of us who resist online. Or character four, respectability politicking for sure, but still wants us to be all right. How will these four people unite? That's what it takes. No one cast away, nobody left behind not even the most problematic kind. See, we cannot reproduce the force that tried to kill us off. Us off. We cannot reproduce the force that tried to kill us off. Because if we do, I'm telling you, we'll have to pay a real cost. Look, what I'm saying is quite simple. We cannot throw each other away. 
We are complex and conflicted, often stuck in our ways, but regardless of all that, we're absolutely here to stay. So let's teach one another and be open to receive because we really need each other. This is a fact guaranteed. Thank you. Thank you. I'll save any remarks that I have about those four characters till later. Just sit on it. I think this might be a great moment to have everyone return to the, the, the rug, the carpet, the chairs, the stage. Um, and I'm hoping that we can just uh, take a little bit of time together before we turn this over um, to all the room. Um, wow, what well, three extraordinarily important and potent presentations. And I, um, of course, want to hear what you're thinking, but one of the things that I'm thinking right now as well, first of all, is what it takes to be woke. <laughs> what does it even mean? What does it even mean? Truth and who is gets complex. to claim it? And who gets to claim it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and maybe that's something that you would like to allow us to think about with you as we start to try to at least awaken ourselves to the issues of justice. Because we're hearing about justice, um, legal justice, and the issues of incarceration. We're hearing about justice and the climate and sustainability, which at this point I'm thinking is not just about what I do, but these tremendous systems that include my iPhone. and. Um, the ways in which we create equity and equality and raise people up from oppression. How can we think about awakening ourselves to all of these issues together? Well, I mean, one thing that I wanted to look at in this particular piece is what it means for people with different ideologies and different ideas that have formed different conclusions in life but have similar goals about what they want the world to look like and how they want their societies to function, what does it mean for them to be in community or to be in coalition with each other? I know that I say something that's not necessarily popular at the end of the poem, which is that we need each other because it is more comfortable and convenient for us to exist in our individual silos of thought amidst the community of people that are similar to us and that think like us. What I understand to be true from my years of life is that that is not necessarily going to create the circumstances that allow for us to engage in the type of community work that would actually facilitate the transformation of legislation, that would be able to maintain and sustain the campaigns necessary to critique the very social issues that we how, that we allocate so much of our energy and emotion toward grieving, if that makes sense. And so while it's not necessarily an easy thing to do, and I'm not saying that we necessarily have to be in community with people that are engaging in harmful or toxic behavior, but rather, what does it mean for us to be aware of the challenge of coalition building and the, and, and the fact that truth is complex? Right, and that um, what we find, at least I can say in the four characters that we offered, is that all four of them say problematic things, and that all four of them say things that kind of make sense a little bit. And what do we do with that? Because the people that we think are always right are sometimes wrong. And sometimes the people that are always kind of wrong, kind of sound stupid, are sometimes right. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know if we engage that enough in this time. Yeah. I, I I think one of the big pieces of this that I take with me is how can we work together to solve these many vital and important questions about our lives together. I'm also fascinated by the power of words, the confession, the false confession. All you have to do is say, I did it, right. and, and then it's a fait accompli, you did it. Well, it's, that will be, I mean, not necessarily, but it's sufficient to support a conviction. That's standing alone, if maybe all it takes. 
not, I mean, not necessarily, but it can be. Um, can we ask each other questions? Or yeah, absolutely. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I, I, I mean, I thought your piece was incredibly powerful and really resonated with ideas about care for one another and for the world, and also with ideas about justice in so many ways. Um, but I, I, I did find myself thinking about what it would feel like to write the next verse or the next, um, it's, a, it's a call for this communication across difference. Yeah. And yet when I tried to imagine those four characters trying to do that, I think it's, it, it could be very difficult, which you, which you say and allow, but I think they would find in each other, you just said, we don't have to do it when things get toxic or when, thing, when it's toxic. And yet in each of them, or in some of them, there were things that one another would find Absolutely. toxic or beyond the pale or, or um, so difficult to engage with that they might not try. Right. And so how do, we, how do we live that practice and how do we teach that practice which I agree with you is incredibly important, especially in these polarizing times when people are sometimes quicker to dismiss than to show the grace of treating each other as human. Um, how do we not just call for it, but do it? What would that next scene look like? You and know, I don't know, what do you think? It's a challenge because I really appreciate that question. And, I'm, and as we, the whole, kind of process of the play is thinking through what it means to ask people to be willing to communicate across difference, which again is not just like an, in, it's not just intellectual labor, it's an emotional challenge, right? And so this is what I am not doing. I am not asking people to offer their intellectual labor to people that are unwilling to hear and to understand a perspective outside of their own, because that can be a level of emotional and intellectual, dare I say, trauma or labor that is not necessarily yours to have to disseminate or give away to, in essence, an intellectually brick wall, if you understand what I'm saying. And so, but I think that where we, when we talk about especially restorative justice in this conversation around justice is, is the willingness to shift there or is the willingness to be open-minded enough to understand your perspective there, right? Now, when we're in a moment where folks are being held accountable for saying and doing harmful things of their past that now come to the forefront, whether that's somebody running for office, whether that be a comedian, whatever it may be. Some people are critiquing this moment and saying this cancel culture is just some leftist ridiculousness and whatever. And other people are saying, what a beautiful thing that the internet has created such a democratizing space for us to communicate about things that otherwise people wouldn't be held accountable about, right? And I would say this, is that if the, that I, I think that we have to engage the conversation of are we willing to communicate with people that think differently from us if they are willing to receive, hear, understand, and again, I am aware that that's labor, but sometimes the work that is most necessary is laborious, you know? Well, I would refer to the conversation that many of you missed uh, before, before this, uh, this, 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 this part of the program, when Fumi was really talking about the power of art. And in a way, um, if you had the opportunity for those different types to be in the same audience watching the play, it could be a fairly cathartic moment because there's, a, there's also what I found very nice is a, a slight element of humor in it, right? And so that really, it, it's, it makes it uh, more, uh, it's, it's not quite as serious, right? You're not, you're not being mean about it. You're kind of poking fun at it. Most definitely. And it would be, you know, the power of art is like, well, what happens if you go some you know, you take this play to a place where you would have people representing those different points of view all together in the audience, right? Mm -hmm. There might be an opportunity there for saying, yeah, well, called me out on that one, right? Or, 
or whatever. Um, so I thought that was very, uh, it, it had that very powerful uh, impact to saying, yeah, I recognize, I probably recognize myself in all four of them, you know, in a different, different yeah. ways, right? And yeah. so just uh, having the opportunity to be in a safer space and see something that's, a, you know, not exactly me, but the parts of it are me, right? Yeah, one of the, and I appreciate you saying that because it makes me kind of reflect on one of the things that I got from the last performance that I did of the show that I'm so grateful that you were able to see, Victoria, um, at um, the Skirball, not far from here. And um, one of the people in the audience um, commented, wrote to me later on saying that she appreciated, in hindsight, she appreciated, in the moment she didn't appreciate the fact that like she had to deal with the discomfort of hearing and seeing and feeling the people next to her agreeing with characters that she did not agree with. <laughs> Do you understand? It happened in here. Right. You understand? Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. And right. so it, it's an interesting thing when you're hearing the character say something that is extremely politically incorrect or that is difficult, that is in some way, shape, or form problematic or challenging or whatever it may be. And then there's like a, like a yeah. Do, yes, I agree. And then you're just like, what the? <laughs> and, but it's like, that's, I want us to get through the emotional layer of like, that, that keeps us from actually being able to be honest about where we stand. Right. I just want, to, I, I really, in, in kind of like a broader way, like, I really want to advocate for human beings getting to the root, like, Tell the truth of where you stand and be open enough to hear somebody say something that you don't agree with at, without emotionally shutting down and preparing to combat their argument with your argument. Mm -hmm. You know, and so you feel me on that. Okay, and, and again, it, it can be, it, 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 I know that it's, it's, a, it's a challenging thing to ask of folks, especially when you're hearing people say things that are damaging rhetoric that can contribute to the very types of cultural and social behaviors that can be harmful. You understand what I'm saying? If you hear somebody spewing homophobic rhetoric, understanding that informs the kind of culture that might put the lives of queer or trans people in danger, I'm not saying that we accommodate Please, I don't want us to mistake those words, but I do want us to be able to understand that we do live in a time now and historically where communication looks a lot like I'm listening to you just enough to prepare my argument to prove that you are wrong, <laughs> right? Like, oh, gosh. So, just enough so, to prove. So I think it's really interesting um, the way you describe the shift uh, in our perceptions of the legal system, and that it came through empirical evidence, but it was also, I think you were also saying it's part of a deeper set of thinking about whether the system is working on all kinds of levels. And that, I think, is a really incredible example of the possibility of a really profound change. I mean, just enormous. And can we look at that as a, model for how we begin to unpack those kinds of things. I don't know, but it was it's an extremely uh, heartening transition, actually. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's not, not finished, a, right, it's, it's, it's far from finished, and yeah. it's only one component of the legal system writ large, but it is a story of pretty dramatic change in discourse, right? In spaces for engagement around questions that are being taken up by vastly more people from, from activists to legislators to judges to academics over a pretty quick period of time. And I, I mean, again, I don't want to tell some overstated story about like, you know, woohoo DNA evidence and now the criminal justice system gets way better. Like it's, it's not that univocal and it's not that simple by any, any, any means. But, but there is a way where right now, and it's partly about things like wrongful convictions and DNA, it's partly about things like Black Lives Matter. I mean, it's a whole confluence of engagements. But right now there are 
spaces for conversation about criminal justice reform, mm -hmm. unlike anything we've seen in a long time. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's, I don't want to be naive or Pollyanna-ish or too optimistic about what that will mean, but it is, it is it's exciting. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah that's, that's really cool, got to say. <laughs> I think maybe this would be a good moment to take a short break. Um, forgive me if I stepped on a moment in conversation, but it's here's okay. what I'd love to have happen. For those of you who have been here, you, you kind of know the program. This is an opportunity um, not to go away from us, but to turn to somebody you know or don't know. And what are the questions that are coming up for you? What are the points of engagement that you see between these different scholars, artists, presenters? Um, what are the hot spots? What's the question that might, you might be afraid to ask? Because we have to deal with our fear in order to engage one another and to take that next step together. So please, talk to each other, and we'll come right back to you to hear your thoughts. Let's come back. Um, I'm inviting you back into a room together. So just finish those conversations. Um, and let's turn them into uh, an opportunity to speak with our guests. I just, um, one guideline I'd like to offer is um, that I'd like you to keep your question short. Like, if it's over a minute, it's way too long. 30 seconds is fabulous. And I see already there's some people ready to ignite this space. Let's, and please say your name as well. Oh, we have a microphone for you. It's coming. It's coming from this side. And then up there. Okay, great. My name's Allie. I'm interested in law, so I have a quick question for you. I was just kind of wondering what your opinion, the statute of limitations, ha like the effect that that can have on justice, um, and whether you think there's a corrupt uh, branch of the statute of limitations, or if you think it's really more helpful rather than not. You just your thoughts, you? basically. Well, it's a big question, and I, I mean, I guess I'm gonna, I'm, I'm, I'm going to partly punt and partly try to answer it and say that um, like many aspects of, of justice, we can come up with hypotheticals or examples where to have a statute of limitations feels unjust, and we can also come up with examples where not to have one feels unjust. So, I mean, some of it depends on the seriousness of the wrong and how we understand that and how we understand retribution versus restorative justice, right? right? Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, certainly it can feel terribly unfair when statutes of limitations um, don't recognize that some kinds of wrongs may not come to light for a very long period of time, or that people may not be in spaces where they're able to describe what happened to them until they get through or over trauma that may keep them from coming forward. And that if then there's no way to bring somebody to justice, that can seem terribly, terribly unfair. On the other hand, to not have statutes of limitations and to say that any wrong from the distant past can be taken up at any time, no matter what's happened since, also seems like a, a pretty, uh, a, a frame about the universe that lacks um, compassion or a recognition for grace or transformation. And so I don't think there's a one-size-fits-all answer. I think it's an important set of conversations to have about, about um, accountability and what it looks like. Uh, and so that, I mean, I could, we could talk about this further, but that gives you a little bit of a flavor of some ways to think about your really, really good and thoughtful question. Yeah, I, I had a question. Uh, my name is Vusi. Uh, so, you know, I, a miscarriage of justice or a lack of justice to me appears, seems to be an existential threat to each of your practices. So for an artist, loss of your voice, you know, stripping away of your opportunity to, to, to 
a practice, you know, for a lawyer, it's like um, you constantly see people in prison or sentenced to death. Uh, and then for the environment, it's like we could lose the planet. You know, so how, what, what does that mean for, for you in, in terms of, I mean, where do you find your optimism, your sense of hope to keep pushing forward given the existential threat that a lack of justice, a miscarriage of justice presents to us? That is a great question. <laughs> well, I think it, there's a lot of ups and downs. <laughs> That's what they say. And, but um, I think that it's better to live a life where you have hope for the future than not. And that there are such amazing people out there working for justice and change that it's incumbent upon my work to support their, um, their struggles. And so I see my role as providing information and analysis that most people can't produce themselves because they don't have the resources. I'm in a very privileged position, and I should use that responsibility, have a responsibility to use that position in ways that I feel can enhance the dialogue and enhance the ability of people who are the most disempowered to actually engage in the future, in their own future, um, in, in with armed with better understanding of the arcana out there about how um, the system doesn't necessarily work for them, and I and I just think it's a matter of um, dignity. I mean, it's my it's my responsibility, it's my job, it's my commitment, and. I have no choice either, and I'm inspired by that um, commitment of others. Yeah, I feel kind. Of, I feel quite similarly to you in terms of like, um, and I've used that language before, kind of feeling feeling like I don't have a choice. Like there has to be some level of hope, but then also it makes me think about how when I talk to um, my students over at Cal State LA that like. A thinker like ta Coates, you've heard of ta mm -hmm. Coates, the author, when, when asked if he has hope, a lot of the times his response is just like, no, no, I don't have hope. Um, because in that, um, they're almost, he articulates it as yeah. like this it's emotional, really right, yeah. like this almost really like this, almost like this emotional response to something that's very kind of like logical and physical in a way where it's like, these are the things that have been happening historically where there has been, where justice has not been served in a number of different instances, but that if we just allocate our attention and energy to hoping that things right. change, that maybe then it feels distant enough to not take responsibility yep. for doing whatever is necessary to actually change it. But I don't think that hope is fleeting. I think that I understand the point that he's making. And I will say that maybe the thing that gives me hope is the awareness that historically there have been societies that we now would say were just absolutely devastating, traumatic, and dramatic. The institutions that this nation has overcome, albeit slavery turned into prison industrial complex, but I would say that you know, it has taken different shape, that there have been social transformations that people, normal people, have taken on the account, the responsibility for striving to change, and that if that has happened historically, then it can happen again and again. And even though we haven't reached a point where we're living in an equitable society, we've been at least able to change the structure of some of the systems that cause dehumanizing devastation. We still have a lot of work to do, but there's something that has been done, which means that in the future, there's something that can still be done if the damn world doesn't explode because of the damn environmental issues. You understand what I'm saying. But, I, mean, um, <laughs> I think it's a really powerful question. And you know, UCLA, we, we talk about Bruin optimists, right? Um, but, uh, but there's, we also have to recognize um, the depth of the challenges, which is part of what your question puts to us, yeah. and especially the environmental ones. I mean, if we, if we can't find a way to save the planet, that is the fundamental existential threat. I mean, the rest of right. it doesn't, then we don't have a chance to do justice or create more equality or, or to make our, our, the fabric of our connections deeper and better. Um, and so that, 
you know, that has to be, these have to be things that we, that we, that we take seriously and that we recognize um, that we can't do alone. But I think we can find power in those moments of grace and improvement and in the, power, and in the chance for connection. Those times when you link to another and you see the power of an idea and you see a small change and it lets you believe that something bigger and better is possible. Um, whether that's a realistic belief or not is hard to answer, but I think it's one that you have to hold on to to try to, mm. to, try to do justice. Now, I'm really hearing from all, all three of you that it's not about um, finding us ourselves at the place, our goal. You know, it's not about solving the problem, but that the project is living our life in the struggle of engaging and, and making things better. Um, and maybe even about the interaction between one another is the really critical sense of life giving. Um, not, not necessarily that the problem will be solved, but that we are working together for something, and that maybe is the life project itself. Ah, okay. Right there. Hi, my name is Hosian. So, we learned how we should shift the focus of environmental justice towards the equal distribution of resources. And so my question is, what's the role of, the, of individual activism? Uh, in that system? Uh, that's a great question that I'm glad you asked. Um, so I would change the question just slightly. And I would say, what is my role as an individual in uh, finding a group of people with whom to work for change? Because I think that uh, one of the brilliant uh, successes of late capitalism, if I may be so blunt, <clears throat> is to make people think that they can, that, that they are alone and that they uh, are alone in the face of all of this stuff and that it's incumbent upon them alone to do something better. But in fact, we can't do it that way. And it really re requires us to work in collaboration with others because, you know, strength is in numbers. And it also gives you more, uh, more hope, <laughs> more energy, um, and you are feeling like you're actively participating in something that is greater than just you. And besides, change very rarely happens through the activity of just one person. There may be a person who ends up as the figurehead or as a transformative agent, but they come from something. They come from a larger set of uh, activities with other people. I mean, you think in the civil rights movement of people like Martin Luther King, but think of the armies of people he had supporting what he was doing. He, he wasn't a single individual. He was a transformative figure or you know, any number of people. So I think that we forget that um, humans are social beings, that we act um, in society, we don't act as an individual. You don't exist without me, I don't exist without you, and together we're more than the sum of our parts. And you, I, so I would urge um, lots more group political activity <laughs> Um, because that's so powerful. I mean, when I was growing up, um, in 1970, there was um, all of the activities against the Vietnam War. We shut down university campuses. We walked out. We said no. I couldn't have done that by myself. I could have walked out of class, but. <laughs> um, and then, you know, there were a million people who showed up on the streets in Washington, D.C. Those make an impact. So I think that what we need to do is get that reflex back and realize that you know, late capitalism has really frayed our abilities to understand that we work as a group in society. So. Mm -hmm. um, so I, um, I think 
came into my adulthood during the um, anti-apartheid movement and then um, sat through watching a lot of the truth and reconciliation um, hearing with, um, and was really moved by the power of truth telling and restoring kind of um, the community by listening to, really deeply listening from the heart to the harm and thinking about healing the people who were hurt more than the punitive justice of punishing the wrongdoers and shifting that to let's heal and repair and fix versus punish. And so I'm wondering, yet, you know, South Africa still has a long way to go, especially in terms of resource distribution, um, but they have their successes in terms of, so I'm just wondering what you guys think of, any one of you, of really shifting the narrative to looking more at truth telling and listening and um, restoring and repairing versus punishing? Um, you know, it makes me think a bit about so much of um, our critique of the way that prisons, or I'll even say more specifically prisons in this country work. So I think for, for you, even your question, the way that it's framed is how, how to help heal the harm that is done to the person that is victimized by the crime, or is the victim of the crime, um, possibly, or of some type of wrongdoing. Whereas a lot of the time when, when I think through restorative justice, I'm thinking about the harm that is done to the individual or to the victim or to the group of people. But then I'm also thinking about what exactly is taking place in prison. And we understand on a very clear, obvious way that prisons do not rehabilitate and they do not do what it is that they um, are, uh, the, that the, the argument is that they're supposed to do. Um, that prisons um, traumatize and that the recidivism rate is high. That people go into prisons, um, they serve their time, they come out and then go right back into prison um, because they can't have access to the resources necessary to actually change the circumstances of their life which might prevent them from engaging in the crime that might send them right back to prison, and of course living in hyper-policed communities which are poor black and brown communities for the most part. And so I think that um, so much of the, re the kind of discussion around reform versus just like complete and utter transformation of our prison systems is just under the fundamental reality with the awareness that it doesn't do what it claims to do. There is no rehabilitation taking place. There is trauma um, and, and devastation that takes place. And in essence, we are not doing the work of public safety because it's supposed to be about public safety. What makes a safety, what makes societies more safe based off of the studies that at least I've engaged and forgive me if I'm wrong, but to my understanding, once again, this is um, mental health resources. This is um, educational and extracurricular resources in communities to make it so that people have access to the things and education and actual quality affordable education to make it so that people do not actually have to engage in the types of behaviors that might send them to prison to begin with. And so some reflections on the idea of healing versus simply punitive and then which, which communities are going to be the ones that are punished also, right? And then is it going to be um, and then even the possibility of those getting punished after not necessarily even possibly, what's the wrongful conviction I'm talking about, but that's a whole other kind of longer conversation. Yeah. I, just to add very briefly, I mean, there's some limited ways in which restorative justice practices have a, have a soft footing in our system, but it's so far from being at the heart of how our system currently operates. And I think, I mean, my own view is that there's, there's room for so much more of that. Um, I, I, I don't know that I think it, it, it can be, um, I don't know what it would look like. Maybe I'm not, I'm not, um, I'm not creative enough or I'm too uh, much a product of the universe that we have to imagine a criminal justice system that was entirely um, grounded in, in restorative justice um, standing alone. But there have been some really interesting experiments um, of, of giving people the spaces to uh, engage directly 
and achieve healing. And in many instances, the victims want less punishment in, um, when they've had that opportunity. They want the perpetrator to have less punishment, not necessarily no punishment, but less punishment because of these spaces of engagement. Um, and I mean, in our system, there have been places like you know experiments with drug courts and treatment and, and other ways of engaging, experiments with victim impact statements to give victims a different kind of voice. Um, but there's certainly room for far, far much, you know, far, far more um, if, if we were able to take it seriously. Mm. I don't know. Oh, cool. Yeah, this happens every time. But I'm Emily Geneva. But we kind of had this question come up because of this one of the audience members. So I guess we were wondering, like, in the case of like microaggressions and discrimination and hatred, like, what is the role of the bystander in educating those people or like the perpetrators, um, which do, like which does not engage in like a heroist narrative or um, yeah, dominate the discussion from a privileged vantage point. Yeah, does that? What is the role of the bystander in these circumstances that doesn't come from like a hero standpoint, right, where you kind of come in, swoop the day, and be like, see, I've saved everyone and I've fought mm -hmm. bigotry today. Yeah, I'm not here. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right, right, right. So, um, so I think that if I, th that I think on a just kind of on a, on a basic level, that we should be willing to be courageous enough to say something, not because we want to be the heroes in the situation, yeah. but because it's wrong. It's wrong. Like I, I, I want us to get down to like very simple. Simplify, oh, simplifying these these discussions rather than being like, well, you know, I'm not sure, and it, like I should just allow for them to engage in that, and it, that's labor that I don't know if I want to allocate. But just really kind of the simple of something wrong is taking place. I am here observing it. I am witnessing it. What way can I impede on the harm being done without necessarily putting myself in physical harm's way? Right, like, and then taking that into consideration. And so I think that I just have a really simple answer to that is like what the role of the bystander is, um, is to say something without, and again, it is not necessarily to take on the charge of putting oneself in physical harm's way. That's not necessarily the charge. And also there is no charge. I wanna, like, like nobody is responsible for, for, be, for doing or for, for helping or somebody who is in harm's way. Like there is no, to my understanding, universal law that demands that we do that. I think that in order for a society to evolve in the way that we might desire it to, that it makes sense for us to take on that charge. Not so that we can have that emotional kind of psychological gratification that we are good people, but that just because. I, I also think there's a, there's a kind of common sense practical side to that um, and that we should feel as though there's a certain amount of accountability in society and it doesn't have to be anything grand you know it can be um, something small about people's everyday rude behaviors and say you know that was pretty rude or you know, it's about it's about trying to um, without without making somebody feel ashamed or being too judgmental. But there are judge, judge, judgments to be made about people's behavior. And you know, if you see a kid misbehaving, um, I, I don't see anything wrong with saying you know that was not a very good thing to do. Right? I mean, there's a way in which this kind of hands off of um, enforcing just kind of goodness or nice, you know, just decent behavior. I don't quite understand it. Um, you know, it's like, hey, kid, what do you think you're doing? Right? It's like, <laughs> but it's also, I don't know, <laughs> maybe I'm too authoritarian, but there, you know, there's kind of a sense of like, 
I was at farmer's market, uh, that was about a, you know, several years ago, and there was a guy who was on a complete insane rant. And he was going around all of the stalls with um, you know, not white vendors, right? And he was just saying the most atrocious stuff, whether they were Asian or black or whatever. And I, I just couldn't take it anymore. And I went up to him and I said, bug off. What do you think you're doing here? Who wants to listen to this shit? Um, <laughs> but it was like a moment of just moral. It's like, what the fuck? Who, who said you could do that, right? And so I think there's something just about kind of spontaneous reaction to what looks like it's really just whether it's a kid doing something, you know, whatever, or an adult, there is a responsibility, I think, just to say something without putting yourself necessarily in the middle of a knife fight or something. To, sort of, to shift this a little bit, Thank you. I think that there's... Um, <laughs> Um, I think there's, you know, there, there's, there's concerns at both extremes, right? There's the concern about silence in the face of, of um, bad real, of, of bad behavior, whether whether words or or otherwise, at one extreme in ways that really are quite troubling. And at the other extreme, there is kind of call out culture, where you know, the minute somebody uses the wrong word or says something that um, isn't put as felicitously as they would wish suddenly they're, uh, they're ostracized or made to feel like they, um, that they have no voice. And so right, there's right. hard questions well, well about put. how we manage that. And I guess I think that one thing that we all owe to our communities um, is to make a distinction between the action and the person. Mm -hmm. And this in a way goes right back to Fumi's characters, that good people do bad and imperfect things. And so when you want to critique it, there's a place for that, often an important place for that, but that you should try to engage in it in a way that critiques the behavior and not the human, and at least you should start there and, and from a place of grace and compassion think that this doesn't mean that this person is bad, but rather that they did something in this moment right. that caused harm and you have a better chance of getting them to listen and to hear and potentially to change if you start from a place of making that distinction. Um, you know, again, I'm not gonna say that there aren't um, people who behave in ways that are so egregious that we are no longer to, willing to give them that, 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 that benefit, but I think your, your performance captured that beautifully because some of your characters said things that I think many of us found troubling and offensive, but you were also trying to show us that they, that they were coming to an issue that they cared about from a, a, a place of wanting to make the world that they saw better. Genuine. Yeah. And, you, and, and it, oh, please, yes. Please. Well, um, I don't, I'm actually wanting to, I know everybody needs to go home, but <laughs> my, my thought about that, though, I was going to do a little wrap, wrap it up mm -hmm. here because I think that exactly what you said, Jennifer, about us being able to not cancel one another out, but to see the larger opportunity that exists because of our shared common goals, I think that applies to us here in the university, mm -hmm. too. That, you know, we are always going to struggle with what some people have and what some people don't have. Like the, the difference in power, students, faculty, the difference in finances, support, budgets. But it seems to me that the work then, the opportunity that's here on these Tuesday nights, and as well in the university as a whole, is to continue open up, to, to continue to open up to um, hearing one another's perspective and the ways in which we have learned through our lives to come together and begin to do the work together of the project of making it better for all of us. So well put. Um, I hope that um, it's okay to go Excuse home now. Do we, have an, do we have time for one more question in the back, quickly? 
Um, I think I think you'll have to take your question forward as Do people you have are leaving. Office hours. I, <laughs> I'm, I'm so sorry. We'll 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 talk down here for, for a few moments before people leave. But I want to be respectful of everyone's time and make sure that you all get to go home at a reasonable hour. Thank, Thanks you. for being here.